Hey, GM. <laughs> How you doing? I'm doing well, Matt. Thank you. <laughs> cool. It's we been, started with a laugh. That's good always to healthy. See you, buddy. And you, yeah. mate. It's good to see you too. I hear it's pretty windy up there or where you are at the moment. Pretty windy oh, and cold yeah. and winter is approaching. It's cold and blustery and I'm loving it to death. It's great. Awesome. <laughs> Well, we, we had an awesome chat last time. This is a little bit different. You know, I suppose you could call them power pods, number one, and uh, just getting right. into some um, some groovy topics, you know, and just trying to break them down in, in 20 or so minutes. So, yeah, I thought this week we'd talk about, you know, perception, reality, um, the nature of reality. And, and, you know, is our perception what you might call ultimate truth? You know, what what... What is the ultimate truth? So, yeah, let's mm. unpa unpack that for 20 minutes. I mean, what are your thoughts? That's lovely. Well, when it comes to uh, our perception of reality, uh, not many people actually have one for all the obvious reasons. Let's go through them, shall we? <laughs> all right, the one that everyone is taught at school. Everything you see. The light goes into your eyes, your eyes turn that into an electrical impulse, that goes back into your brain. You eventually see a picture somewhere in the middle of your brain. That's what you're seeing. When you touch something, the nerve endings picks it up, they send uh, obviously a, a, um, an electrical impulse to the brain, the brain gets the impulse, it forms a picture of what it thinks that felt like, hearing exactly the same. You know, sound waves hit the eardrums, the eardrums do this, they send off electrical impulses, you hear it somewhere inside your brain. Basically, if you look at that, your average person has never been outside of their head until they die. So, you know, that's kind of, uh, A, you're living in virtual reality, B, none of it has anything to do with the outside world. Well, that's it. I just lost C, but <laughs> you get the point. So <laughs> that's the first veil. If you can get past that, so that's the first veil. You've got the second veil then, which is your psychology. That's a veil because when things do come in through your eyes and your ears and your sens sensory organs, they're going to get filtered through your ego. As, they, as these pictures and these um, sensations come into the brain, you have this ego, the, this hedge of thought process, which is basically built up of opinions and judgments and beliefs and traditions, etc. So whatever comes through your eyes, your ears and all the others, you're going to have little thought things here going, oh, that's not very good. Oh, that one's all right. No, that's terrible. Don't like that. That stinks. Don't touch that. By the time the information, the true raw information gets to the center, it's ripped to shreds. And then the brain, and we know the brain will do this with anything, will put it all back together again. But what you're seeing in there, what you're feeling, what you're thinking about what you're seeing is irrelevant to what's actually happening outside. You can keep adding to that. The fact that there's 100 million colors out there and we only see, what, seven? Mm at best you see and then you've got this internal sight that can see in the dark that's in there looking at your thoughts looking at your dreams looking at your imaginings that's a whole different sight that's giving you different information so no our perception of reality is uh, th three times removed from what's actually happening and, then, and there's a way around that. We're educated to do that, by the way. <clears throat> as you know, and as most people know, there are pictures and paintings that go back hundreds and hundreds of years of saints and wonderfully enlightened people, and they all have this halo thing. Mm. Now, if you read about that and those people and the people that actually painted those pictures, if you read their records of that and not the religious ones, you will see that these are people that they have met who have expanded their awareness beyond their skull and they actually see reality raw as it is. And when they start to speak to people about raw truth, people don't understand. Why? Because they're used to this third-hand information. Can I add one more thing? Do you mind? 
Go for it. No, I'm going to pick up on something you just said, but go for it. Just as an example, let's pick a guitar. You have a wooden instrument. You have a piece of hollow wood. You have a string on that wood. Let's say this particular string is metal, a metal guitar string. So you have a metal guitar string. You pluck that. It's moving at a certain vibration, certain frequency. It's made of metal. That's its material. That will transfer its vibration into the wood. The wood is going to make a different sound. The air in the wood is going to make a different sound again. So now it's one hand removed from the real sound. Mm. So that sound now is going to pump air inside. The air has, is a completely different medium to the wood and a completely different medium to the metal. So now you've gone metal, wood, air hasn't even left the instrument yet. So now it's pumping air, hydrogen, oxygen, helium, and a whole bunch of other gases. What's happening there? Molecules are hitting each other and forming a chain reaction wave. We call it sound. Fourth-hand information. You haven't even heard it yet. Those waves are then going to hit your ear. Skin with hair on it. Just change the sound completely. Fifth-hand information. You still haven't heard it yet. Then it's going to hit your eardrum. A little bit of skin covered in wax. It just changed that to that. Six hand information still hasn't got to your brain yet. That's then going to hit three little bones inside your ear. Each bone is a different size and shape. It just changed sounds three times. Where were we? Six. Nine hand information still haven't heard it yet. Cochlea goes through the cochlea, creates an electrical impulse. What's that? 10, 11th information. Then you hear it. You are the 12th person in line. Talk about <laughs> Chinese whispers. And that's just that. That's all I want to say about that. Let's so, go on. So, so my, um, <laughs> you, might, you might have answered my question there, but my question was going to be just before you said that was you were talking about someone being able to kind of see ultimate truth, I suppose. But you almost described it in a very, I suppose, kind of broken down scientific way. But funnily enough, if we all, if that is ultimate truth, it is the analysis of the dynamics of the the physics in in that sense and and everything else. And actually, it would be somewhat of a nightmare if we all could see ultimate truth, I suppose, because you know, or we were analysing ultimate truth. However, is that then? Is it about being present enough to be more? alert to truth in a way of how you just described. I mean, you wouldn't, as someone plays a guitar, you certainly wouldn't want to be thinking about that process you just described in every note that they mm -hmm. ping, or you'd be spinning out of, you know, mental control. But at the same time, is there a way to kind of observe what you just say in some sort of present state so that you do have at least some clarity to what might be ultimate truth, I suppose? For your average person or for someone who's actually well, just come for, out? Uh, well, I, I suppose I don't, I don't, the question isn't are people, the question is can people. So I suppose, yeah, for, for the average, how would the average, how would the average person approach wanting to really ex perceive truth beyond the chaos that we kind of live within, within our thoughts and all of our different senses and everything else? <clears throat> the only reason that the human realm is like this is because we are never ever taught or even encouraged to expand our awareness. We're not taught about it. No one speaks about it, probably because it's not locatable. It's invisible. It doesn't age. You think about it since the day you were born, your body's grown older, you've got wrinkles, your hair is gray, your eyes don't see as well, your ears, your ears don't hear as well, but your awareness of all of that hasn't changed since the day you were born, it hasn't gotten older, it hasn't diminished. It's that, it's that part of you that doesn't grow old. It's wonderful stuff. But like anything else, if you don't use it, it atrophies. And that's the problem, it's atrophied it's very easy to expand beyond the skull and come back if your awareness is as strong as your willpower, is as strong as your determination to eat food today. If it's being developed in balance with the rest of our faculties, everyone would be able to just expand out, see reality for what it is, and then come back in. It's called ebbing and flowing. Mm. All schools of mysticism have a name for it because it's a very real 
scenario. Mm. So if you want a bigger bicep, if you never use your bicep, it'll atrophy and you'll just have this scrawny little useless piece of meat hanging off your arm. If you want it to grow, you start lifting weights. You, you exercise that muscle and it will grow in strength and size. Awareness is the same thing. When was the last time your average person went out and spent an hour a day exercising their awareness? I don't know of anyone that does that outside of my world. And yet your average person will go out there and go to a gym for two hours and sweat like a pig and do all the rest of it, which is a great thing to be doing for your body. Mm. But you're not doing it for one of the most important faculties, which is the awareness. Anyone can do it. Just start to exercise your awareness. Through meditation, you mean? Or? Oh, no, no. It's as simple as pick up a pen, yeah. close your eyes, <clears throat> put your entire mind in your finger and your thumb, and you start to feel it. You know, is, uh, are there any scratches? Are there any divots? Can you feel any writing on there? Is there a difference between the metal and the plastic? <clears throat> How cold is it? How warm is it? How heavy is it? You're, you're, you're expanding your awareness. You're not looking, you're just using one faculty, which is tactile, but you're being aware of everything that's coming from there. When you're walking through the forest or through the streets, be aware of what you're thinking, be aware of what you're feeling. What did you think to feel what you're feeling right now? What did you feel to think what you're thinking right now? When you're walking, feel your heel touch the ground. And how are you walking? Are you a toe walker or are you a heel walker? If you're not watching and being aware, you won't know any of these things about yourself. Mm. You just expand your awareness beyond whatever it is you are aware of normally all day long, which is usually, I've got to go to work, I'm hungry, I need to go to the toilet. You see what I mean? It's just not much going on in your average life that expands your awareness. So just use it and it'll grow. You know, like as you talk down, having had a couple of weeks away and been in cities, I don't live in a city, but I, I'm online a lot. So I kind of do my work through a laptop, which I feel very fortunate because I live in nature. And, mm. you know, coming, I realize what you just talked about then comes a lot more naturally when you're in nature than it does when you're Absolutely. walking around a city and I, I don't know whether that's really the construct of a city or probably more just the density of people in busyness as opposed to necessarily concrete and buildings maybe it's a a bit of both but certainly just being in nature can kind of induce that that process without mm. having to necessarily make an effort with it and then you become aware that you're actually in that in that state of of realizing what's going on you know yeah there's a mob mentality in the city that there isn't you won't find in the forest of course when people come together they become a mob i'm not talking about the negative mob that goes mm. looting and things but when you get a whole bunch of people together they form a mob and it becomes an entity of its own and under negative situations it becomes a very bad entity uh, there's no leader in a mob and that's why it always goes wrong and goes bad. <clears throat> but in a city, everyone's there. Well, you know what people are there for in the city. They're not there to look at trees and flowers and be one with the animals. That's not what they're there for. So the city is a whole different ball game. And scientific fact, we know that whatever you think, whatever you're looking at, whatever you place your mind on, changes as soon as you look at it we know for a fact that when you look at um, say the the photons in a laser beam if you just focus on it and it doesn't have to be long and hard just a normal person they will they'll move it they will change the direction of the uh, subatomic particles that's been demonstrated a hundred million times and when you have a whole bunch of people in a city and not not too many of them are happy and in the city, you've got crime, you've got people looking for victims, you've got predators, you've got et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that affects the city and the material around them. The mob mentality is creating a certain consciousness in a city situation. And this might sound like a psychology question, or maybe it's not. It may not have a psychology answer. But in that example, is that just the... The, the influence through the senses of being around all of that behavior or is it something yes. more ethereal than that? Okay. 
No, that's it. Plus the fact that if you want to earn a living in this world, the world of humans, mm. you you have to, uh, you just have to be long to it. You have to step into it. But you have to be able to step out as well. It's tough. And going. <laughs> it's a tough one, eh? you got to earn a, it you got to earn a crust to keep going. It, yeah, exactly. I love the way you just I, called it, you called it this world of humans, which I love that description because it, kind of leads the question to what what other worlds are there how many are there which maybe that's another episode so i don't want to overstep too much but i love that description of a, a wor- this world of humans it's a <laughs> <laughs> and it's a very tiny one believe you me compared to the universe and the galaxies and the trillions of planets out there and the billions of planets with life on it the human realm is extraordinarily small mm. yeah we're um <laughs> our belief of what we are is far, far from the truth. Let's leave that one alone. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a great segue for the end of chapter one in these short snippets. And um, for anyone watching, yeah, this is one of probably eight. We're going to be uh, short and concise. Unless there's anything else you want to share on perception, reality, the ultimate reality, I think you know, that's a pretty good, good snippet on it. The, the truth found. And um, I look forward to episode two. It's always good to, to chat, GM. Oh, Matt, I thoroughly enjoyed it as usual. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Enjoy your day. Oh, and yours. See you guys, everyone out there. This is 1095.